good day philosophers. So this phrase, the Socratic method is a phrase that uh, I, I think gets tossed around in culture. Like people talk about the Socratic method, but what the heck is the Socratic method, right? It's not something that's that, that, that you should take lightly. It's actually extraordinarily intense, right? So the Socratic method in Greek is, uh, is the Alenkis. And it's a kind of what we'll say is a self-refutation. It's where Socrates leads you to ref reflect critically on your own beliefs about a thing and try to arrive at what's fundamentally true by analyzing your own beliefs. In particular, remember, what's what Socrates do? He asks this what is question. This what is question, which is fundamentally asking not just what um uh, not just what you mean by a word, but what a thing is, right? Remember, so ultimately this all of this comes down to this what is question by Socrates, where he wants you to be able to grasp and say what is the definition of a thing. Not what someone just happens to mean by a particular phrase. He's never going to be satisfied with just trying to know what you think about something. He wants to get to the truth of it. Remember, what was the criteria for knowledge? Knowledge is justified true belief. And so he wants to know exactly what you're saying is true, and he wants to have the right justification for it in order for us to have a real belief in the thing that we need to actually get to the nature of what a thing is. Something that Socrates thinks is unchanging, even if people and the words that they use is always changing. We need this answer to this what is question. And so Socrates is going to challenge us to go through a kind of alenkis, right? And that's what we, we, we encounter here in um, in Plato's Euthyphro and in the first book of Plato's Republic, where Socrates leads people through this kind of self-reflection. A lot of times it almost sounds like Socrates is just doing nothing but completely... Um, you know, messing with people's heads. Like Socrates is this guy here, like, hello, I'm Socrates, right? And what do I do? All I do is I like, I, I, I mess around with folks. Like I, I ask them tough, annoying questions. And Socrates is just refuting people until they they change their beliefs. But that's, that's not necessarily uh, what Socrates thinks that he's doing. He's not trying to refute anyone. He's trying to get someone to refute themselves so that someone will sort of, think about their own ideas. Uh, Socrates will ask questions like, yeah, uh, like what is this? And he'll um, raise objections to the kinds of things that people are thinking. And then he wants people to really compare all these things that are going on in their head. This one belief over here, this other belief over here. And he, he wants people to realize that perhaps this belief here doesn't necessarily coincide, doesn't, isn't cohere with this belief over here, and that maybe I don't really know what the heck I'm talking about at all. And so I want to give that general structure, and then we'll kind of see how it played out a little bit in some of these texts. So in, the, in this Greek, uh, the, in Greek, this, this, this Alenkis, this self-refutation of the Socratic method, it always begins with someone claiming that they know something. What did, what did Euthyphro claim in the Euthyphro? He claimed, I know what piety is. I know that what's the right thing to do towards my own father, right? And so Socrates is like, great, then you just give me the definition of piety. And then a uh, person comes up with some kind of definition, right? And then uh, um, they have to reflect critically. Socrates leads. Now, again, this is what Socrates thinks of what his action is. He's going to lead someone through this kind of reflection on this definition to see if it's consistent with these other beliefs that they have. And... Um, it almost never is. There's always some kind of contradiction which causes the person to have to redefine and repeat this whole process. Now, at the end, uh, theoretically, maybe you would come to a definition, but in practice, that's not really what happens. We have in uh, what we call uh, aporia, right? And aporia is really a translation of um, an impasse, right? Right, that, that you don't actually... Um, you just got have nothing but contradiction after contradiction after contradiction and that contradiction where you just are, are left with the question itself, right? You're left with, um, er, er, that says left, left with the original question, right? Um, and you don't really have a definition at all, right? And so um, this kind of aporia is where you realize that you, uh, some good reasons to think that something you think is true, but you also have all these reasons to go against it. You just don't know. And so when, when you get into the state of aporia, it's almost what I call as a kind of state of unknowing, right? It's like a state of unknowing. And this, and we'll, we'll, we'll reflect on 
what's good about being in a state of unknowing at the end of this lecture here. But let's let's see how this plays out just a little bit in the text, right? And so we were reading um, some of the Euthyphro here. And um, if you'll notice that, remember, well, remember a couple of lectures ago when we were talking about how Socrates immediately said that I need to become a student of yours, right? And so Socrates then says, Euthyphro, please tell me what is piety? And what does Euthyphro say? Um, well, let's let's find Euthyphro's first definition. If we go here on uh, marginal line 5e, you'll see that Euthyphro says something like this. Well, I claim that the pious is what I'm doing now, prosecuting someone who's guilty of wrongdoing, either of murder, temple robbery, or anything else of the sort, whether it happens to be um, one's father or mother, whoever else, and the impious is failing to prosecute. So, so okay, that's nice, Euthyphro. But Euthyphro says piety is what I'm doing right now. Is that really a definition of piety? Is that knowledge? Well, no, you didn't really tell me anything new. All you did is you said that this very controversial action, which goes completely against Athenian culture, is pious. Why? Because it's pious. Uh, I said it was pious. That doesn't really answer the question. That doesn't convince anyone. And so just pointing out this particular action as an example is not a sufficient definition. So Euthyphro will say, or excuse me, Socrates will say, I didn't ask for you just to give me some example of a pious action, like prosecuting your father if your father did something wrong. That's exactly what we don't necessarily, we don't agree about what piety is. So give me a better definition, right? Let's hear where Socrates said this, right? At the bottom of that same page, marginal line 6D, Socrates says, so do you remember that I did not request this from you to teach me one or two of the many pious things, but to teach me the form itself by which everything pious is pious. For you said that it's by one form that the impious things are somehow impious and pious things pious. Don't you remember? Now, it's like, that's a tongue twister of a thing. Socrates here is talking about a form. And so I kind of want to point that out. That when Socrates is uh, trying to get to what a definition is and what you really need to grasp um, it, throughout his method, right? He he ultimately says that there is some kind of form um, that is uh, alike in all examples, right? And that this is this is going to be um, this form is going to be the definition. We'll talk about the forms in another class, but this form is that's alike in all example is going to be part of the definition, and so. Um, all right, then uh, Euthyphro gives uh, another definition, right? Um, da, 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 da. He says, well, what is beloved by the gods is pious, and what is not beloved by them is impious. Okay. So Socrates, how does he react? He says, excellent Euthyphro. With this, you have answered in the way I was looking for you to answer, whether truly or not, right? That, that I don't quite know, but it's clear that you will spell out uh, how what you say is true. So now Socrates has taught Euthyphro a lesson that Euthyphro needs to do more than just cite examples. So for instance, if I want to know what a dog is, um, you can, it's never sufficient to give examples, right? Just remember how we said the priority of definitions, right? You can never learn a definition by looking at examples. Um, you can't learn a definition through examples. Now, this is really problematic. And this we'll talk about more when we read Aristotle. But if you can't learn what a definition is through examples, well, the, how the heck are you going to learn what the definition is? How are you going to figure it out? But, but Socrates says you can't learn through examples. Don't just show me an example of piety and say, from that example, I should know what piety is. I need some, you need to tell me the form, the intellectual idea that cuts across all the examples. And so Euthyphro thinks that he gave something that could be more than an example, right? He, he thinks he could have given a form. What was the form? something that is beloved by the gods. Now, Socrates will ultimately reject that as not being the true form of piety. In part, Socrates says, well, because the gods disagree about what they actually love. Um, and so therefore, um, uh, what would be pious to one god is not pious to another. But then he argues that really that we should flip around the direction of that. What makes the pious loved by the gods is not 
Uh, it's not because the gods arbitrarily just choose to love whatever they want, but the gods love things that already are pious. Now, Socrates would say, why, if we reflect and put in a contemporary example, why does uh, someone say pizza is delicious? Is pizza delicious just because someone says it's delicious? Or do people say pizza is delicious because of the inherent deliciousness of it, right? Or if someone says that uh, a beautiful performance uh, by a musician, right, is a, is is beautiful. Is, is it beautiful? because the person calls it beautiful or does the person call it beautiful because there already is something inherently beautiful in it? Now, Socrates would say, because there's already something there, it's already there. And so remember when we were talking about the definitions of things versus words, the paper on the ground here, right? That just like Socrates says, we, we there's a difference between the definition of a word versus the definition of a thing. And what makes a word a word just comes from people and their own um, agreed upon statements about it. When we're talking about the definition of a thing, it doesn't come from that, right? And so that is going to be part of Socrates' challenge to the truth of what Euthyphro goes through. If we read the rest of this dialogue with Euthyphro, we'll see we we're, we end up with so Euthyphro continuing to give new definitions and redefinitions. Socrates will explain first to help Euthyphro see that what's loved by the gods isn't sufficient, and then he'll start going through, and at the end, we'll end up with no definition. You can read the text and see that. Let's just quickly also talk then about and see how this plays out in the Republic, right? Where it's not enough to give an example. You need to give some type of common form. And until you can get to it, you won't get to it. In the Republic, uh, we encountered Socrates talking, um, Plato's Republic here. We, we encountered Socrates talking to a bunch of people. He starts off um, just leaving a festival. And uh, after this festival... And there's a, a bunch of folks, Polymarchus included, who try to stop Socrates and say, hey, come talk to uh, our, our father, Cephalus, and um, we'll sit in here and chat about stuff. And um, so Socrates uh, is reluctant and eventually goes, and he starts talking to um, uh, Cephalus about some stuff. And uh, all of a sudden, this question of justice comes up. You know, Cephalus is an old guy. I like there's a great line here that says that... Um, that that uh, Cephalus is on old age's threshold. You see that? And to be on old age's threshold means you're about to die. So Socrates says, I, what am I going to talk about someone who's about to die? Well, people who are old and experienced probably know about things that matter in life. Maybe he should be wise. Let's talk about um, happiness. Let's talk about how Cephalus, why he's such a happy guy versus others. And in part, Cephalus says, well, because I'm rich, I've got money, and that makes it easy for me to be a kind of just person. And so Socrates eventually asks him, what's justice? Well, um, Eventually, we got this statement, uh, and here I'm on um, actual page five, marginal line. Um, where are we here? About 331C um, uh, to D. Here, um, so, uh, Socrates is trying to ask Cephalus what justice is, and, and Cephalus basically seems to be saying it's speaking the truth and paying one's debts. Okay, speaking the truth and paying your debts. Now, Socrates then starts to question Cephalus about uh, whether this really is justice. And what does Cephalus do? He says, uh, I'm getting tired. I'm old man. I'm going to let Polymarchus talk to you. Does that remind you of anyone else? Remember Euthyphro at the end of the Euthyphro <laughs> says, um, I got to go. I, I, uh, I don't have time to talk to you anymore. Cephalus, same deal. Hands the conversation off, though. It, instead of the, the uh, just ending it, it's handed off to Polymarchus, who is Cephalus' son. So Socrates then talks about, to Polymarchus about these de very definitions. And he very quickly refutes the idea that justice is paying your debts, because Socrates talks about this example. What if you owed a crazy person a weapon? Like uh, like you borrowed a gun from them or something. Well, they wouldn't talk about guns then, but you borrowed a weapon and then you owe that person a weapon. That's the debt you have to pay. Should you pay that crazy person that weapon back? And Polymarchus will say, no, that would be a foolish thing to do. And so, and he says, well, you should, maybe, maybe justice is um, owing your friends good things and your enemies bad things. And, um, and then uh, we start to go through and wonder who are our real friends, who are our real enemies, and then it seems like the just person is the one who's able to act the most unjustly towards other, to, to, to deal out punishments towards other people. It goes on and on and on. And by, by the middle of the dialogue, Socrates uh, has Polymarchus so messed up that he doesn't really have an answer at all. Socrates says, all right, since it's become apparent then that neither justice nor the just consists in benefiting friends and harming enemies, what else should one say it is? And in that point, the dialogue uh, Polymarchus, he also bails out. He's all messed up and it hands it off to Thrasymachus. And we have something similar going on. Remember, all this culminated at the very end of book one, where Socrates has this famous statement, 
Hence, as the result of the discussion, I know nothing, right? Um, throughout these dialogues, Socrates challenges people to give this definition. And as they reflect upon their other beliefs, they realize they don't necessarily know what they think they know. So if we look again um, about what this the Socratic method, it ultimately is this, this process where someone thinks critically about their own beliefs, but always ends in this impasse, always ends in aporia. That's what Socrates is in, um, or at least theoretically he's in with these other folks just based on this conversation, this kind of state of not knowing, this impasse where you are left with just the question itself. However, what is the point of this? What's the point of Socrates walking around the city of Athens, asking people questions to define things, and yet in all these discussions that we have, and really in every discussion Socrates seems to have, he never arrives at a beautiful, clear definition of anything. What's the point? Why does he bother doing this, right? And so what, what, what's, what, what is the purpose? What is the, the purpose of the Socratic method? Now, and I'll, I'll tell you the answer. The purpose of the Socratic method is to, um, to adopt a philosophical attitude. It is to ultimately to make someone into a philosopher, to become a, that says a philosopher. What Socrates wants is he wants to change people's attitude towards these questions that they're being asked to ask. He wants people to change their their um the way they think about things that matter. So here's the deal, right? In the end, nothing is really changed in terms of someone's knowledge, right? In the beginning, someone thinks they know. So like here's me, like here I think I know um, what piety is. I think I know what justice is. I think I know uh, all this stuff. After you go through the method, what do I realize? Um, I, I realize I don't know. And it wasn't that I knew and then I stopped knowing. Like here I knew everything and here all of a sudden I don't know anything anymore. No. In fact, nothing really changed in terms of the state of my knowledge. I never, I never actually knew. I only thought that I knew. And so something is important in my own kind of self-knowledge. So when I, in order to develop this philosophical attitude, in part, I have a, a better knowledge of myself. Know thyself is one of the most important things. Um, and that's the challenge of the Oracle uh, at Delphi. Anyways, uh, that, that I have a new kind of self-knowledge. I know something about myself. I know that I don't know. Um, but also, I think Socrates wants something else to change for us, right? He doesn't want only for me to just realize that I know that I don't know, right? He wants um, someone to realize, anyways, oops, da, 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 da. Oh, this is not what I want. Sorry, I've got, oh, I was trying to play with my PowerPoint. It didn't have the things on there that I wanted. That's no big deal. Um, I, I, I know that I don't know, but also I realize that that it's it's worth really digging into these questions, that the questions have, uh, the questions have real value, that it, it really matters what the answer to these questions are. Not only do I not know, but I ought to want to know. I start, I need to uh, start to wonder about these things, right? So here's this deal, right? That, uh, and, and let me, let me draw an analogy. If you think about yourself in class, you've probably have, you've taken tons of classes. This class, just another one. And in most of your classes, your teachers ask you questions. And why, uh, and, 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 and when a teacher asks you a question, say, especially in a test, do you agree that you want to get the answer right? Why? Well, maybe just because um, you want to get a good grade. Okay. So, but do you really care about the question itself? Do you want to like actually think about the question. Have you ever taken a class where the teacher asked you questions and you actually wanted to know the answers? You actually wondered about them. And 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 you you studied not just because you needed to understand stuff to do well on a test and get a good grade, but because you legitimately wanted to know. Well, that's what Socrates wants. Socrates wants you to hear a question and be compelled by it, to realize, I don't necessarily know what I think I know, but it's worth knowing. I have to know. And that in seeking knowledge, um, or 
in, in that this I need to become the kind of person who legitimately seeks for knowledge for this. Now, did that was that successful here in the state of aporia, in the state of unknowing? Um, did uh, was there more self knowledge in say Euthyphro? Right. Well, Euthyphro probably realized he didn't know what he thought he knew, but did he really care and value the question? I don't know. We didn't really see what happened there. Did Polymarchus or even Thrasymachus, um, did any of these guys have, have a real value in the question? I don't know. I don't know if Socrates is completely successful there, but that's what he wanted. He wanted the person to become a lover of wisdom, someone who realizes they don't know, but sincerely devotes their life rigorously to pursuit of this knowledge. Fortunately, in Plato's Republic, we'll see that um, it doesn't just end at the end of book one. This is one, uh, uh, one of the few discussions we'll encounter with Socrates where it doesn't just end at Naporia. We encounter Socrates continuing the conversation with two folks who've adopted this philosophical attitude, Adamantus and Glaucon, right? So when you read book two, right? Actually, why am I doing it there? I can just do it here. <laughs> when you read book two of Plato's Republic for our next class, you're going to see Socrates engaging in this conversation with Adamantus and Glaucon. Now, uh, through this, who adopted this philosophical attitude, knowing that they don't know, also desiring to know because the question is something that's worth knowing about. And, um, and, and, and acting like a philosopher. So this is who Socrates is. Next class, we'll, we'll, we'll take up this question of justice itself and actually see what some of the positive things Socrates has to say about justice and, um, and, and what's his deeper connection to wisdom in general. Um, I hope this was a helpful lecture. Have a beautiful day. And I will talk to you on the discussion boards. Adios.